And <clears throat> um, I have so many things to say that I don't even know <laughs> if I'll have the time, but I'll try my best. So my discussions theme is broad-based. Uh, broad it's basically the first thing is, I want to talk about the Jens paper, but I also want to talk about the issues that he raised, why we are confronted with this issue in the profession, and what we can do to fix these issues, because we should, don't want these issues happening again. Right? And so that's what I would focus my discussion on as well. And it's good I have 15 minutes. So basically, let me just talk about the paper first. So obviously, the issue is that it's very messy data. And if you look at the literature, it's actually shocking how much the number of observations varies. It's pretty much the same sample period, about 2002 to 2016 or 17. Um, it's 0.8 million to 0.4 million in a paper in the RIPS by Dang et al., and 1.3 million in this paper. And um, so obviously you need a standardized cleanup because uh, they're all over the place. Um, and also you think that WRDS, you would think that like, they have a bond database, right, corporate bond database, you would think they would fix it. But these uh, Jens and Lars and their co-authors say in the paper, and I also observed this, that these guys truncate the top at plus 99%. The bottom minus 99 makes sense, right? How can you truncate a bond return at plus, plus 99%? A bond can easily double, right, over a month? The monthly return can't rise about 99% in words, and that doesn't make any sense. So the words is not going to work. It's these paper, this database that's going to be more likely to work. Um, so you can see that even Wharton Research Data Services puts out databases that are not completely okay. All right, so this particular paper's contribution is that uh, it's a lot of good things. So. Um, as you can see, he, Jens already did a great job. Um, sensible cleanup, um, RAs and cross-checking, sensible sorts by ratings, then the characteristic. Very careful description of filters, unlike other papers that seem to slide things by. They did an outstanding job in explaining exactly what steps remove how many observations. We need more of that. Uh, in co incorporates multiple hypothesis testing. They didn't spend much time on that, but the MHT, uh, Benjamin E and so on, they did that too. Um, also, very constructive tone, very just treatment of the previous literature. One or another paper in the JFE is just like attacking. And this one is really constructive and really makes a, treats the literature very fairly. And I thought that was very important. So it's a fantastic paper, and this is exactly what we need to move forward. Um, so what they find is that the bond characteristics don't have stable alphas. The stock characteristics they find are much more robust. Three, I would point out, are the six-month stock momentum that predicts bond returns positively. The one-month stock return that predicts the bond returns negatively, and uh, the, in, the Titman um, away investment factor that seems to also work. So it's not just CAPM, right? Uh, one, one thing I was observing was that the monthly reversals are attributed to liquidity, but since they see that the stock return is associated with the bond return reversal, it seems to be that it might be some overreaction rather than liquidity, just an aside, that it, they could sort of make a big deal about that, right? Um, remaining issues in the paper are that on the Firm level analysis could be split by bond rating category. It'd be interesting to see credit, uh, credit risk versus non-credit risk, low credit risk. Um, there should be some documentation of how correlated the returns in these characteristics are. Um, that's something they don't spend much time on, but each factor is not independent of the other, so they might want to spend some time on that. There's another issue in the literature on factors about risk versus mispricing. And Kuntara Dick and I have a paper in the RFS, as you know, on a protocol for doing this, and Stefano Gigli also has a paper. So some notion of whether it's covariance risk or mispricing would be useful. Um, I think we do need to understand how many of these factors are associated with the covariance matrix. So that's something that could be done. Um, also, some notion of hypotheses would be good. The expected signs and what you get in stock, uh, in the, on the stock factors would be very useful. They don't spend much time on the rationalization of these things. And then some theories would be good, okay? But these are some of the things they could do to enhance the paper, but again, you know, I think it's publishable as is. These are maybe follow-up things. So uh, very, very nice job. Let me move on now to uh, what we can do to avoid crises like this, like uh, things don't replicate. So let me now go into that. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, there's a lot of decisions to be made in these databases. Uh, trace returns, for example, are often uh, over 1,000% and incredibly negative 100, less than negative 100%. Um, how to treat them is something that previous work really doesn't address. Uh, then we have databases that you can mix and match. You can either add the data stream, NAIC, or you may not. Uh, maybe it's just a matter of Tmax, you know, like you want to get significance, you figure out what to do. But that's unacceptable. We have to have a standardized way of treating these things. Um, how to evaluate is itself an issue, I've discovered, because 
bond prices can be stale, right? So you, you can't market cap weight necessarily uh, because the bond trades once a month. So a better approach is to simply wait by amount outstanding, not notional amount, because obviously there's no split issues and bonds, the number of face values are the same. So you can just wait by amounts outstanding. But the results seem to you know, be sensitive to that. I think that that's something that we need to standardize. Um, another thing is how to deal with bonds that drop out, drop out of the holding period. For example, if you're doing momentum, uh, six months they're there and the next month they drop out. What do you do with the bonds that drop out? Should you drop the observation in the uh, formation period? Should you drop it only looking forward? Well, that makes a difference, and you have to think about it as a researcher, what you want to do. I'm just raising this question because these are all discussions that authors have, but they don't make it to the paper, and the reader is left wondering, what do I need to do to replicate the paper? But I think they should be in the paper, all right? So um, this is one other issue about whether you should do the valuated market of all bonds or just use a standardized index. That makes a difference, too. So all these things make a difference, and different papers do it differently. So that's all. Now let's talk about some issues related to finance research in general that I've been observing that are in actually top journals by journal editors and uh, post holders in AFA, which I won't name, but they have these types of phraseologies, and I find them somewhat unacceptable. Okay. So let me give you one example from a JFE paper by a guy um, who actually is an or was an editor. He says that he wins arises at the one and 99 percentile points using the pool distribution from 93 to 2000 of the data. But you can't win arise 93 data using 2000. Uh, and the reason is trending variables, right? And also uh, forward looking bias. Um, let me go to the third one rather than every one of them. From an RFS paper, eliminated return observations over the 99.5th percentile. Cross section or time series, forget about it. But literally looking at the entire data matrix and simply dumping uh, the right tail. And that's forward looking, right? So you can't really do that, as Jens would agree, you can't really do that. Um, and there are many of such examples where they do ex post filtering, where you know, just look at the entire matrix of the data, cross section time series, and simply dump the right tail, or dump the left tail, or dump both. But Dumping both or dumping the left tail creates a return measurement bias. For example, if you're dumping all bonds below $5, well, if it goes from 10 to 4, it's dropped. But if it goes to 10 to 14, it's not dropped. So the measured return is biased, right? And yet, this happens all over the place. And I'm thinking, what? You get away with it? I was shocked to see all these things. More. Let me, let me give you more examples. Um, new US decisions, OK? Uh, a, a paper by a very important person in the profession says, uh, with more than 1,000 sites, says, we use the new US correlation and com correction in computing the t-stats. There's no information of the number of lags, not in text, not in legend. We need to converge on how to choose the lag. The lag has a specific science associated with it. For example, is it Bartlett? Is it uh, a cutoff, a cutoff um, pattern in the autocorrelation? These require different treatments. We need to standardize this discussion and say, like, you need to disclose the number of lags and um, how you chose them. You can't very well choose the number of lags required to make it go away and say that it went away. And the reason is that standard errors become noisy as you increase the number of lags beyond the optimal point suggested by New West. So the new US decision has to be standardized and referees should be, you know, should be more proactive in saying, like, what exactly did you do? But apparently, you can just say that and get away with it. And I'm saying, you know, what? You shouldn't be able to do that, right? Um, let me uh, comment on a couple of other issues. These are all issues that I think we need to address as a profession. We have to stop thinking, like, oh, we get a result, we just get away with it. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, beta decisions. Now, the Farmer French 92 paper started a trend of uh, basically um, sorting stocks into portfolios based on uh, rolling betas and size, and then looking at the portfolio and assigning the, uh, calculating their full sample betas and assigning the portfolio betas to each individual stock. This process assigns approximately 80 stocks or 80 bonds with the same beta and has a look ahead bias. Right? Look ahead biases, in my view, are a very bad idea. I think we should do sensitivity analyses when we do betas. In fact, I still don't know how the betas were chosen or estimated in some of these papers that Jens referred to. So there's another piece of confusion. We need to standardize the beta discussion, at least do a robustness check. I'm almost uh, getting to the end. The 
the value weighted equally weighted discussion itself has a problem because I would argue that anything that prices liquidity or liquidity risk should be equally weighted because liquidity is more likely to be priced in the smaller uh, bonds, right? And so whether we value weight or equal weight as per K Wei Ho is not something that people are trying to slide under the table. It's just a matter of whether you're trying to price liquidity. So I think we should be careful in the economics. Okay, now, we're not done yet with all these issues because I have more to tell you. Another problem seems to be, how much time do I have? You uh, Thank you, thank you, I'm well on time. Okay. Um, Another issue I have is with uh, <laughs> simple asset pricing regressions. So here's a paper in the JFE that says, we study whether variable X affect the cross-section of stock returns. We determine the higher returns associated with variable X as a premium. I can tell you, cannot tell you what X is because that would reveal the author. But more than 1,000 sites, important person. The regression they actually run in equation one, uh, well, it's not really equation one, it's honestly, is return IT on variable IT plus controls as a pooled OLS. Okay, first of all, a pooled OLS is not a study of the cross-section because it mixes time series and cross-section, okay? The contemporaneous relation they're measuring, T and T, is not a premium because a premium is about expected returns, so you have to have T minus one, we all know that. And yet, it got published. I said, look, first you gotta clarify the theory, get the equation from the theory, and then test the theory. And if you want to do reduced form like was pre prevalent in the Bill Schwartz regime, at least the re reduced form should conform to what you claim. But it's not doing that. And so I think that that's another issue that we need to address to make sure the regressions are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and referees should be proactive as well. Uh, now here's my big thing, <laughs> disclosure. So I'm not sure that uh, the papers that Jens referred to as failing their application I actually disclosed what they did, and I'm, I'm, this might be scandalous to some of you, but I'm very open about it. You have to disclose what you did. For example, the maximum re reported trace return is, as you said, about 4,500%, maybe there's a typo, and there are many returns less than negative 100 as well. These returns were treated in some way by the authors. I cannot, cannot imagine they included them, but the, 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 the description is extremely sparse and opaque. Um, and I think that that also is unacceptable to us as a profession. We should require that all the information be disclosed. Um, and some are, sometimes the bond return is simply omitted from the summary start uh, table, as Jens would know. They omit the bond return, so we can't even check what they did to the bond return. Because if, if, we can, if you know what the bond return on uh, some stats are, we can check against whether the errors are taken out or not, but they omit the bond return. And so we're going to be inferring and guessing, as uh, the, the paper was saying, as to what was actually done. Um, and so, so now let's, let's summarize. There's three more slides. So as you can see, the point of saying all these things is that we not, if we don't address these issues, we're going to get into this situ embarrassing situation again where people have clouds surrounding them like, oh, really? I'm going to look at your paper differently because you did this. But I can tell you there are tons of papers that do these things. I, I think they're just not even advertent. It's just that in the rush, you just forget to say things, or you forget to think carefully. But you can't let that happen because we'll destroy ourselves in the end. So ref we all have to be more proactive, hint, hint to the editors in the room. Um, so I would say for authors, please totally read exactly what you do. I would say that if you have more than one co-author, just make sure the regressions are cross-checked between the two authors. Don't just accept the results. Please understand and avoid look-ahead problems. These look-ahead problems have become pervasive where people just dump observations forward-looking. And you can't really do that. You want to bias the return in one direction or the other. And then ensure robustness so that you don't get embarrassed later. Now, I understand when you get proprietary data, you just rush to be first. But the exposed costs are steep, as we are finding out, with these things not replicating. It's very embarrassing for the authors. Um, asks for non-authors. Um, if you don't mind, then going back to Matt Spiegel stuff, if you make, let me look at the middle point. If you make r and R's contingent on non-existent results, you're creating incentives for people to get the result. And there's too much money riding on assistant professors and we have to be careful about that. So I think that if we require more balanced appraisals, we would be in better shape than saying, you need to get the results, you need to get this result to publish this paper in the RFS or JFE. I think it's very important to make sure the reasonable, standard is set reasonably rather than requiring results that don't yet exist which really creates hassles for junior people. They would never, in my view, 99% of them would never bend, but it still creates a subconscious incentive, and we don't even want that, I would say, okay? 
Um, so I think that we should also, if you find a mistake in a working paper, we should just tell, email the author saying, look, do you have a problem, rather than trying to get them exposed. Uh, it's a much cons more constructive approach. Um, I think that's right. Okay, so the overall message I would like us to take away is that um, these earlier efforts with Trace and stuff were extremely messy. Uh, lots of stuff going on. They made lots of judgment calls. Some they not prob dis didn't disclose, but, but the data was new, okay? So I would suggest that we should just build on each other and it's time to move on using uh, this particular paper as uh, the new standard for corporate bonds and let bygones be bygones. This is my, my way of thinking about it. Uh, you might defer. Um, but I think that another thing is that the theories are not well understood. The interaction between corporate bonds and stocks is not well understood. So, for example, these spillovers, these reversals that um, kind of carry over, we should think more about where they might come from. Um, that's it. Thank you. <coughs>